and she's a develop or a biological developmental biologist. developmental biologist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so her specialty is in neurogenesis, neurogenesis and mechanisms underlying microcephaly. And so um, she knows more about the SATB2 gene than I think anybody. So she's going to sh volume up. Okay. Yours, I think, will be. We can double check. How does uh, testing? Can you hear me? Anyone? Oh, this might be off. Yeah. So anyways, um, she's going to go ahead and give her presentations, and I think there'll be time at the end for some questions. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Fish, for being with us. Can you hear me now? Just give it one second. It'll... All right, now it should be good. Now? Yes. Ooh, wow, that was loud. <laughs> um, so my name is uh, Jennifer Fish. Um, I'm at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and this is my email address. So um, I would, anyone that has questions, or, or comments can, can uh, find me there. Um, also, you don't have to wait till the end. If you have a question, uh, this should be interactive, I hope. Um, so I'm gonna give a talk. I know that uh, roughly half of the families this year are new, half were here last year. So, so some of the things that I talked about last year, I'll, I'll explain again, that may, um, but I'm also gonna talk about some new, new research. Um, so um, as Ashley said, I, uh, work on the development and what is SAPI2 doing in development. Last year there was a uh, number of questions about uh, the mutations it's themselves. You know, why did this mutation occur? What are the chances of this mutation happening again, et cetera? Um, that is not really my area, and we do have geneticists talking later, so, um, so save those questions for them. Um, if you have questions related to development, um, you can ask me. I'm just gonna See if that helps. Okay, so just a little bit about me um, and my history with SAP B2. Um, so I grew up in Arizona. Um, I eventually went to Germany, uh, represented by the pint glass, where I uh, did my PhD. And, and in that context, I was doing neurogenesis. So I have um, a, a reasonable background in genetics and neurogenesis. Uh, when I started my postdoctoral uh, career, I went to the United Kingdom, and that's where I first started working on SAPI2. And in that context, it was in craniofacial development. Um, I'm not sure it shows up, but yeah, so I was at UCSF uh, for a while, uh, where I, I studied other aspects of craniofacial development. Um, and now I'm at UMass Lowell, um, and we have a, um, I would say at least half the lab is dedicated to various projects related to SAPI2 and what is SAPI2 doing. Uh, the major grant that I currently have funded in my lab is dedicated to understanding a SAPI2 in osteogenesis. So <clears throat> what I'm first going to give you an outline of the talk. So one, how do genes relate to phenotype? So we talk about we have SAPI2. It's a gene. We see that um, there are certain uh, phenotypes that you see if you have a child with a mutation in a SAPI2 gene that we can describe. But how, how does that mutation relate to these different phenotypes that you might see. <clears throat> and that will be quite brief because that will be embedded in the rest of the context, which is, you know, what is SAPI2? Um, how do we study SAPI2? And how do we more specifically try to understand how mutations in SAPI2 contribute to the various phenotypes um, that we observe in, in, in humans? And uh, finally, um, I'll give a little bit of a research update, some exciting new findings we have, and how this relates to uh, future research, and in particular, um, potential therapies, which I'm sure is what interests most of you the most. Okay, so how do genes relate to phenotypes? So in the um, press, they're often talking about, oh, we found the fat gene, or we found the gene for aging, or you know, whatever they might have found the gene for. Well, it's not usually that direct. So the relationship between a gene and a particular phenotype is usually nonlinear. So you might see here, so here's a strand of DNA, and that would be where your gene, the various genes are. Um, and the gene will uh, produce, can produce RNA. So this is a messenger RNA. This is, um, will be translated into a protein. And this is what is gonna do the main uh, function, this protein. Now, why I say that there's usually not one gene for a certain 
phenotype is because proteins work together in very sophisticated protein-protein interactions. And there are many uh, different elements that can affect um, a biological process that could relate to a difference that you would see in the phenotype. So <clears throat> what we're really interested in is understanding how SAP-B2 um, works with other proteins and what is the particular pathway or the particular developmental process that um, is being triggered. And that's important because it's really hard to treat genetic mutations. It's really hard to uh, make a change at the DNA. But uh, biological processes are things that, that produce metabolic outputs and things that we can potentially modify with a drug uh, treatment. So we really want to understand that, that component there. Um, another reason why there's some variation between a genotype and a phenotype is because uh, different cells express different genes. Maybe it's because I have the two microphones close together. All right, if I hold this one here, maybe that will be better. So um, in development, every individual so it starts out as a single cell. Um, a fertilized egg. Here we have more than one cell, but you know, just a few cells. And these cells will produce um, an embryo, and then ultimately, in, in this case, this is a, a mouse skull, so this is mouse development. But we have um, one genome, and each cell in your body has the same genome, but nonetheless, you have all these different cell types and all these different tissue types. Um, so some, there's a, a process by which these different cells express their different genes. That in itself is more complicated. I won't talk about that today, but, but SATB2 is not important for every cell type. So, and we also know that the cell types in which it is important, it's probably doing a little bit something different. So that's why it's important to understand that developmental process that is involved there. So that's just a very brief introduction to the relationship between a gene and a phenotype. Uh, what I want to talk about now is what is SAP-B2? How have we studied it? Um, and in particular, how do we um, try to interpret um, what the mutations are doing? How are they affecting uh, development? So SAP-B2 is a protein. Um, and SAP-B2 stands for Special AT-rich Sequence Binding Protein. So sequence binding, so it, it binds to DNA. And it binds to DNA um, at particular places where there's a lot of A's and T's. So you may be familiar with the genetic code of which there are four different uh, nucleotides, two of which are A and T, and um, different parts of the GNA have different um, percentages, if you will. So certain areas might be AT rich, and those are where SAP2 will bind. So this is just an example of the different protein structures. So as I said, a gene will make a protein. This is what SAP2 is predicted to look like. And um, these are some important domains, particularly these cut domains here, which are important for this DNA binding um, to, uh, yeah, for SAP2 will bind to DNA. So as I said, so SAP2 binds to these AT rich regions. In particular, there's a part of the DNA that is called a matrix attachment region. So we'll call it MAR. Um, and these MARs are AT rich. So this is where uh, SAP-E2 will bind. So to explain this picture a little bit, the black, you can imagine, is a strand of DNA. And the blue are different genes. And the genes have regulatory regions. A regulatory region is a region that will turn a gene on or turn a gene off. And SAP-E2 is thought to be important in that turning on and off of other genes. So what happens with this stretch of DNA is that it will bind to this um, matrix um, at these areas which are red. And so if SAP-B2 binds to that area that's red, it brings that whole area together so that now we have these three genes can be turned on and off simultaneously. And um, Yeah, no. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 
um, maybe she can help. So the key component here is that, so as a matrix attachment binding protein, it's thought that SAP2 is turning on and off a bunch of genes together. And so, for example, if it's involved in neurogenesis or, or making neurons, it's turning on a bunch of genes that are important for that neuronal development. And the same thing with osteogenesis, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But what it's, it's thought is that SAP2 is a so-called master regulator of the differentiation of certain cell types. So how do we um, study that more? How do we know what cell types SAP2 is important for? So one way that we can detect SAP2, we can either detect that mRNA um, or we can detect the protein that's made by the mRNA. Um, and we do that in both cases. A essentially, we have an antibody and it has um, something that we can see, a visualize. And we can manipulate this so that it either will attach to the DNA or the RNA sequence of, that matches SAP2, or we can also have it attach to a sequence in the protein. So we will then be able to detect visually where the SAP2 RNA or protein is because we have something that we can uh, visualize. And an example of that is shown here. So this is um, a mouse embryo. This is a mouse head. And what is shown in this region here where you see the purple, that is the developing jaw. And the purple is this visual component that, we, that shows us where SAP2 RNA is. And um, so if this is the developing jaw, you can see that it's here um, in the distal or the front part of the mouth, upper and lower jaw. Um, and it's, it's not expressed over here in the region that will form the joint. Um, and this correlates very well with phenotypes we see, um, which are that uh, particularly cleft palate and that it's the, the front or distal part of the jaw that is smaller when um, there's a mutation in SAP2. So we use the mouse model uh, to, to study where SAP2 is expressed and what it's doing. Um, because as, as a mammal, it's a very good uh, model for humans. Of course, we can't look at human embryos. So um, this is um, the primary model that's used to uh, study SAP2. Now, this part up here above the purple um, is the developing brain. So at this stage that's shown here, this is relatively early in development. And you see that there is no purple up here. However, if we look slightly later, and what I'm going to show you is now if you imagine if you made a cut straight down the middle here and you just look at these um, uh, components of the brain. So this is the cerebral hemi hemispheres. So here again, those are those cerebral hemispheres. And here in purple, you see uh, where SAP2 is. And so this is uh, shown um, essentially for a wild type or what it looks in the normal situation. One thing I'll point out, and I'll talk about this more later, is that we have the, this strong blue staining here across the midline. So these are the axons of these neurons that are crossing the midline. And in the absence in this case, there's no SAP2 protein at all. You don't see that. So that's missing. And instead, the axons are projecting uh, down. So this is a major phenotype associated with uh, the SAP2 mutation that it's affecting where these axons project. So it's um, changing the connections, if you will, between neurons. Now, in the case of the mouse, and in, in the case of the brain in particular, the mouse is um, it's suboptimal for the human brain because the human brain um, is, is quite different. And in fact, um, all of the mutations that are in SAP2 in humans are this condition, the heterozygous. So we don't anticipate, um, and the MRIs don't indicate anything this severe, but we um, expect or predict that there may be some differences in connectivity um, among the neurons, and that's something we would like to study. Um, so in particular, SAP2, and so in this case, the SAP2 is shown in all of these images in green, and red is a different uh, protein in each case. Um, but the point here is that 
the SAPI2 is in these upper layer neurons. So the progenitors of neurons are down here. So SAPI2 in, in neurons, it's not in the progenitors. It's doing something specific um, in cells that are no longer dividing. And that will um, be more relevant later. Um, but so these are neurons that, um, so differentiated neurons and these upper layer neurons, which in humans are more prevalent than um, in a mouse or other animals. So from these uh, data, so far we know that SAPI2 is important in this distal part of the jaw where your um, incisors are. We know it's important for uh, certain neuronal differentiation. And we also know that it's important in other bones, so not just the jaw, but um, long bones in general. So what's shown here is a mouse. Again, this is um, a wild type, and this is a complete loss of function. And you may notice, so in this case, uh, bones are shown in red. It's a staining, so um, bones produce, um, they excrete minerals, that's where you get the strength of your bones. And what's detected here in red is some of these extracellular matrix proteins that are making bones. And in blue is cartilage. Um, so the main thing you'll see here is that the bones can be a little bit smaller. Um, and they're also less dense. So some of you may have children with osteopenia um, or um, that are, are susceptible to fractures, et cetera. So it's related to having a low bone mineral density. So that's mo most clearly shown here. So if we just take a cross section of one of these bones, you can see normally it's quite uh, dense. So this is a micro CT, CT which will detect mineralization. Um, and in the complete loss of SAPI2, it's, it's quite um, porous. And so we expect that the heterozygotes have um, an intermediate condition. Um, and so here is um, an example from a, a, a patient with SAPI2. So you'll see that there is uh, reduced density in the bones and also this uh, bowing. And that is something that is associated uh, with a low bone mineral density. So these are phenotypes that um, we're quite interested in. So a couple of things to note from the studies in animal models. Um, one, the animal model uh, recapitulates very well um, the human disease. So when, what we see um, where SAPI2 is expressed in development and the phenotypes associated with its loss um, match very well with what we see with the human patients. Um, with the exception potentially of some of the neuronal differentiation. The other thing that is important to note is that by and large when we study uh, a gene in the mouse system, it's usually a knockout, a complete loss of function. Um, and it's rare that we have uh, studied more of this heterozygote where you have one um, normal copy and one copy with a mutation, and which is more of the human disease model and that's something that we have started to investigate um, in the lab and I will talk to you about. So um, just to summarize, the, the two main uh, phenotypes, if you will, that we're interested in studying and trying to understand um, where do we get uh, SAPI2 or what is SAPI2, what are SAPI2 mutations affecting is one, this neuronal differentiation, and we think um, that it's particularly affecting this axon uh, migration or con connectivity between neurons. And then um, in, in bone cells or osteoblasts, where we think that there's a, um, we see a defect in mineralization. So what we wanna know is um, how is it that SAP-B2 mutations affect these phenotypes, and in particular, um, not just to describe the difference in the phenotypes, but to understand what process is uh, being disrupted um, and, and uh, that would be a potential target for therapy. So um, first we need to know in normal development, we can study normal development and understand what process is SAPI2 um, involved in. And typically we do that by um, a complete loss of function, removing SAPI2 and seeing what happens. Um, and then, um, so how are those processes then altered when we have um, a particular mutation? Another uh, thing that we're quite interested in, um, as many of you may have noticed uh, during this family event, there's a range of variation in the different uh, phenotypes. So even if 
Um, if, let's say, speech delay is a common um, component of uh, the this, this SAS phenotype, it varies from individual to vi individual. Same thing with the slow bone mineral density. So in some um, children, it may be more severe than others. Why is that the case? And can we um, use that to help us understand uh, what processes are, are disrupted? And then um, a major uh, component of our future research is once we understand how these processes are altered, can we then um, try to correct them with um, therapeutic agents? And how would we uh, go about doing that? So um, how do we study SAPI2? As I said, in many cases, we study it by um, a loss of function. So we have this central dogma, which I introduced to you before. We have DNA. It makes RNA, and that is translated into um, a protein. So if you have a mutation in that DNA, that will produce um, an RNA with a mutation, and that could have uh, several effects. So what has been uh, most commonly hypothesized uh, for um, SAP2 is that it, it doesn't generate a protein. So either some, the cell somehow de detects that that mRNA is, is mutated and it's degraded, um, and it doesn't make a protein, or um, uh, it, um, it lacks the components to make a protein, which I'll, I'll briefly discuss, or it makes some protein that is so different that it just doesn't have a function at all. Um, however, we know that, um, that it's also possible that, this, that it could produce a protein that, that um, is, has many normal functions but slightly different so that it, it's just not operating as effectively. So that's also possible. And this is something we'd like to understand, particularly as there are different types of mutations. Some of them may be different, and that might contribute to the variation that we see. So most of the research, in, in fact, almost all of it up to date, has modeled this loss of function. So if we um, generate a, a mouse to study the disease, we do so by just removing one copy of the gene. And so, um, we're not actually modeling the disease mutation up to now. Um, so as I introduced to you, we've done this with um, a mouse model to generate um, a SAP2 mutation. And, and um, when I started working on SAP2, I was very interested in this effect on jaw size. This was um, what I, by chance, I was interested in how um, jaw size varies. And I just stumbled upon SAP2. I didn't have any particular personal connection at the time. I just thought, wow, this is a really cool uh, gene because it had such an interesting effect on the jaw. And what we knew at the time, so um, this is this early um, developing mouse, and this is the head, this is gonna be the brain up here, and this is the jaw, the upper jaw and the lower jaw. Um, I'm not sure how easy it is to see back there, but so this is a, um, a wild type, and this is one, a complete loss of function. Um, and again, we're just looking at a thin section through the developing jaw, and there's a lot of green dots here. And those green dots are um, recognized by, um, uh, we did a stain that, that tells us dying cells. So these cells that are supposed to make this distal jaw, without SAP2, they're dying. And so what happens is that this distal part of the jaw here in the mutant, it's, it's gone. So normally there's this cartilage and bone, and here you see that there's a, a hole where it's lost. And in fact, this then is that mutant mouse, and it has a severely truncated lower jaw. So this is the normal lower jaw, and here it's severely truncated, and also in the upper jaw, similar, it has cleft palate. So we thought, well, that somehow this cell death is um, regulating this process. But what was very interesting to us, so again, we have so this is just showing you now the lower jaw. This is a wild type. And this is the mutant, the complete loss of function. And it, again, it's just this, the distal part. This part back here that's around the jaw joint is, is essentially completely normal. Um, but it's just this shorter distal portion. But in these individuals that have one wild type allele and one mutant allele, uh, which is similar to um, the human patients, we see a range of variations. So these are almost normal in their length, where some are quite 
uh, small, and again, these would be associated with a cleft palate. So we found that, that um, just having one copy, we get a, a significant range um, of variation in jaw size. And in fact, that variation would lead to an asymmetry in the adults, where one side might be larger than the other. And this was very interesting to us. So why should that be? Because especially in this individual, it has the same genes on each side of its developing head. So why is there that variation? So there's a number of components that are contributing to variation, particularly in a situation where you have a one a wild type allele and, and one mutant allele. So one of these is um, a genetic background. So as I said, SAP-B2 or any protein is not doing its job by itself. It's working with partners. And so the state of all of those other partners is going to contribute to how well SAP-B2 can do its job or um, in a reduction of SAP-B2, how significant um, is the impact. So um, you might notice between different individuals, the other proteins that are co-activating or inputs are going to affect how well SAPI2 um, does its job. So one other um, effect is a gene environment interaction. Um, and in this case, the environment could be something related to any sort of uh, stress in the cell, which is, is common in development. Um, and a particular stress-induced signal is this simulation. And, and I'll get back to this because this has a, a therapeutic uh, potential. So the SAP-B2 protein, when it is, um, this, the sumo can modify the protein. So now we have not just a particular protein that's doing its job, but how well it does its job depends on particular modifications. And this is reversible and it depends on how much of this sumo is around. And what is known is that the presence or absence of these modifications will affect where SAP-B2 is in the cell. So when it's binding to the DNA, it needs to be in the nucleus. So this is a nucleus in the wild type. You see it's all this white is SAP-B2. There's a lot of it there. If it, if it doesn't have the sumo modification, um, very little of it is there and it's out, outside of the cell. So this is one thing I'll talk about at, towards the end as a potential um, therapeutic interaction. Because even if you have less SAP-B2 because of your mutation, if we can get more of it into the nucleus where it does its job, that might um, help. Um, and the last sort of thing that can um, affect, a major thing that can affect how well or variation is simply uh, stochasticity. And you might think of it like this. We can say, oh, maybe there's about 100 people in this room on average, but people are going in and out to go to the restroom or, or whatever. But on average, it's, it's 100 or so. Um, but there's going to be some fluctuation around that number. And so one thing that we think might be happening is that for SAP-B2 to do its job, it, it, there's a threshold. There needs to be so much of it there. So normally, in a wild type situation, if you have 100% and you're out here on this graph, even with a little fluctuation in and out, you're still really high and you're above this threshold, and so um, SAP-B2 can do its job. But if you're in a, you have only one copy and you're about 50%, you're very close now to this threshold of where SAP-B2 needs to do its job. And so if there's a little bit of movement around that, um, it can have a significant co consequence. So in a, it, if it's above the threshold, it's on, everything's working. If it's just below that threshold, it's off, and that particular cell um, may be one that undergoes apoptosis. And that might be why we see the variation. So this is a model um, that we were testing. So <clears throat> as I said, we are um, one other, let's say, let's say a final component of the variation may be due to the type of mutation. So this is um, a figure from a recent article that I wrote with Dr. Z, or I mostly Dr. Z wrote and I did some contribution. Um, but here we're looking at the SAP-B2 uh, protein and this is modeling different point mutations. And then what's shown here are the different uh, phenotypes that you might see. And we'll see that the speech delay seems to be pretty consistent 
but some of these others um, are variable. Now, why would that be? It might be the presence of the mutation in a particularly important um, domain, or it may be that that mutation somehow affects what protein is made. So, for example, um, the DNA will make the RNA. So this is the RNA here, shown in green. And the RNA has this code, so these different uh, sequences. And to make a protein, the RNA is, is red, and it looks for this AUG, so that is a start. So that's where the protein will start being made, and it will continue producing um, amino acids and join them together until it reaches a stop codon. So if your mutation affects a change here, and there's no start, then you get no protein. It could be that you have a point mutation, so this here would be a stop codon, and let's say you have a point mutation somewhere in here that generates um, an early stop codon. In that case, you would get a truncated protein. So this is just an example of, this is that star codon, it produces an amino acid, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to the stop codon, and then you have a protein that has the sequence. So you could have a mutation that you get no start, no protein. You could have a premature stop, so you get a shorter protein. You could have a mutation that change one of these amino acids and then it changes the structure of the protein. So any of those things could um, contribute to a difference in, in how SAP2 uh, functions. So this is just an example. Um, actually, it's one of the few where they actually took um, a sample from, from a human patient and they then tried to, they extracted the protein and this is a um, um, a, what's called a Western blot. It's a way to detect um, your protein. And what they found here, so this is the patient, there's two different bands for this SAPI2. And so one, this one here, is the normal length protein, and this one is truncated. So they had a mutation that was producing this, this shorter protein. So we know that that um, can contribute to the variation. So what we set out to do was to try and understand um, how these different components contribute to variation in, in phenotypes, particularly looking at different mutations, um, and giving us a, a model that would allow us to um, better examine what process SAP2 was involved in. So this is Team SAP2. Um, so this is a picture from my lab. This is Evelyn, who's a postdoc, and, and Todd, who's a student. Um, and together um, they have done the research on this project, which is um, now almost ready for publication. So to begin with, we worked with bone cells because it's a, a, a simpler system. And we, these are mouse bone cells, and we can put them in a dish in a culture system and let them differentiate and, and see what happens. And we can measure a lot of parameters. So this is just showing you those bone cells over time. So we start with the progenitors, and over 21 days, if they're in a differentiating medium, if they're getting the right signals, they will differentiate. And that's shown here by this red stain, which is detecting for that, um, those minerals that are being secreted to make bone. So this is um, the assay that we use. Um, so these were, um, let's say they have a two wild-type uh, SAPI2 alleles. So what we did was we used this new technology that's called CRISPR that allows us to do some gene editing. And so you can um, basically target a sequence of DNA um, by having a matching uh, or a complementary sequence. And that, uh, through use of this particular enzyme, it will cut your DNA um, and then induce a repair system that will cause it uh, to repair around this induced mutation. So we um, targeted SAPI2, um, and what we did was we used this method um, to introduce, try to introduce different types of mutations. So this shows you here that we, we made a number of different cell lines, but we ended up choosing one, this colony eight, which is a complete knockout. So we have mutations um, in both alleles um, that produce uh, truncated protein. So no wild type protein. And then we have two different, what we call heterozygotes, that have um, one wild-type allele and one mutant allele. And we have one that has, it's lacking 
um, that start codon, so it does not produce a protein, um, and then one that has a so-called frame shift, so it's missing um, a, a couple, it doesn't have exactly three, it has only two, so it, it produces a stop codon early and we get a short protein. So we then said what happens uh, to these cells when they differentiate. So um, one thing that we notice, first of all, that in these cells, now these cells are all identical, they all have the same genome, and yet some of them are very strong. So here in blue you see the DNA, and in red is SAP2, and it's quite different. So this cell has a lot of SAP2, and this one doesn't have very much. And that's just in the wild type. So why is that? Um, in part, we think, because as the cell is cycling, um, so this is um, a G1, so this is in the early cell cycle, there's a lot of SAP2, and this is G2, the cell's getting ready to divide, there's much less um, of SAP2. Um, and we actually have quantified that using a number of different markers um, to show that really there's a clear separation between SAP2 and these different cell cycle markers, and we're quite confident that it's being expressed um, in this early G1S phase of the cell cycle. So the cell will have this G1 where we have a lot of gene expression going on. That's where most of the cell is, whatever it's doing, it's doing it there. In S phase, it's uh, duplicating its DNA. Um, and in G2, it's making sure that that duplication went well and then it will um, undergo division and mitosis and proliferate. So it made sense to us that SAPI2 was very strong in this early phase if it was um, regulating gene expression and promoting cellular behavior. So again, it was suggested to be this master regulator of osteogenesis. In particular, it was supposed to associate with other genes such as HOXA2, RUNX2, and ATF4 um, to turn on these major bone differentiating pathways. So this is what almost all the literature says that SAP2 is doing um, in bone cells. It's a master regulator of this differentiation. Well, using our system, we were able to look at gene expression. We could take individual cells and look at a suite of genes, and we looked at um, about 40 different genes that are supposed to be important for osteogenic differentiation. Um, and so what's shown here is a heat map, and we have on top all these different cells and all these different genes, and we can see um, how they relate to each other. You'll see that there's a cluster here that's distinct from all of these, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when we look at individual cells and we compare SAPI2 expression to any of these, so SAPI2 here is in orange, and ATF4 is one of these differentiation genes. Um, and we compared our, our wild type to our different uh, mutants, we found no difference. Um, so we could reduce SAPI2 levels and not affect osteogenic uh, genes. And what was more surprising is that if we perform the differentiation assay, and this is what it looks like in the wild type, this is our mutant, and they're differentiating pretty well. So we have a lot of alizarin red staining there. So this um, really suggests to us that, in fact, it's not required for osteogenic differentiation. So it's doing uh, something else. And so coming back now to this cluster, this is a more complete analysis. We have more cells in here, but we still have this block of cells that are red in this area where many of them are expressing blue genes. And this block is, in fact, the block where SAPI2 is the highest. Um, and it's associating, instead of with osteogenic genes, with these cell cycle genes. And so, in fact, what we found um, is that um, if you knock out or knock down SAP2, uh, the cells will die shortly after they've tried to divide. So what's shown here is a wild type, and I don't know how easy it is to see, but we have, in this case, green is DNA, and there's a lot of red in there. This is our heterozygote, where we have just one copy of this AP2, and again, there's, there's red in there, but it's, it's less. You'll just have to maybe trust me. And in this case, in the mutant, there's no SAP2, no protein is produced, and so you don't see any red. But what you might see is these cells, this is abnormal. These cells are, are dying. And what we can also find is something that looks like this. So when the cell 
divides, so now it's making two different cells here. These are the, going to be the two new cells. What you see here is what's called lagging chromosomes. So these guys aren't supposed to be here. They're supposed to be associated with one of these two uh, groups of DNA that should be in a new cell. And the cell recognizes that that's not good um, and it's, it's dying. At least that's what we think is happening. So, so this was interesting to us. It suggested that SAPI2 is doing something different. Um, and in fact, um, what we also know about these AT-rich binding proteins, or these MAR domains, is that they're important during DNA synthesis. So this would also be something that's happening in this G1 phase where we've seen ZAPI2 is really high. And in this case, the DNA now is going to bind to this matrix, and this is where we're going to duplicate. So what's shown in blue is new um, DNA. So we hypothesize that, that somehow in, when ZAPI2 is lower, um, we don't get uh, proper organization here, and then so when the cells try to, to separate, um, they're just not ready to do that. Um, so what this uh, suggests to us is that um, two, two, one, SAPI2 is not required for differentiation. So we just need to try to get more progenitors. We need to prevent this cell death of the progenitors to in increase the amount of bone. Um, and there's a couple of strategies that we, we can uh, use towards that, and I'll um, explain that uh, shortly. Um, but this very much relates to um, the future uh, research, which I would like to, to talk about. So what I've shown you is what we've done in bone cells and in a mouse model. Um, and now we think that this will um, be applicable to humans, but the better way to do it is to use human cells. Um, and we would also like to be able to look at neurons as well in neurogenesis, not just bone cells. Um, similarly, um, we'd like to be able to better model the specific mutations that we see in the human patients, as well as account for the difference in this genetic background, so the difference um, in your, your families. So how are we going to do that if I don't trip? Um, so we are going to use um, a system which now is quite um, established. Um, it's become almost standard technology, um, which is to use a system of induced pluripotent stem cells. So um, basically what this is, is that we take um, a human, so um, ideally a patient and a control, so a relative. Um, and we would take a little piece of skin. So this would be a skin punch. I know some of you have um, already participated in this. Um, and from that skin punch, we can take those, that piece of skin and put it also on a dish. And from that dish, um, it will grow uh, fibroblast cells. So the skin cells, basically. Um, and, and once we get those skin cells, Using this new technology, we can uh, reprogram them into a stem cell-like state. So this would be um, something now that's pluripotent. So these are called iPSCs. And once we have those cells, we can then differentiate them. So I showed you we have this 21-day system to make bone cells. That is, we put certain things, um, so the cells grow in a plate with liquid or media, and we can add different uh, factors to that media that will promote uh, differentiation in a certain direction. So we can take those cells and have them produce either osteoblasts, so we can study what's going on in bone, um, or also uh, neurogenesis, so we can uh, specifically target um, neuro neurogenesis. And the reason why that's important is because um, whatever SAP-B2 is doing in neurons, it's different than what it's doing in bone cells because the bone cells is a proliferation defect. And the neurons are post-mitotic, meaning they're no longer dividing. So it's more likely that SAPI2 in these neurons is, is operating in that first mode, that transcription factor mode, or gene regulation. And what we want to understand is what uh, gene processes in particular um, are being modified. So what do we want to do with these cell types? So we're going to continue studying osteogenesis. Um, and, and in terms of osteogenesis, it's an ongoing process in each and every one of us. Your bones are continuously remodeled. 
Um, and these osteoblasts, which are the cells that we have studied, are involved in making bone. There are also uh, cells called osteoclasts, which are involved in resorbing bone. And it's this balance that's ongoing in your body. Now, most treatments now for um, even SAPI2 um, immutations involve trying to inhibit, trying to block this process. Um, and that seems to be effective. However, um, it would be um, better if we could, in fact, increase bone. This is just preventing more bone loss. We want to be able to create bone. Um, and there's also some concern about those particular uh, drugs that inhibit this pathway that may have some long-term side effects, so we want to look at other options. So since we know that our osteoblasts should function normally, um, we can target um, drugs that might increase or help uh, alter the proliferation. Um, and I'm just go back to this model where we um, showed that this modification to the protein affects um, its position in the cell. So one of our next major strategies is to inhibit uh, this process that will allow us to get hopefully more uh, SAPI2. Even if overall you have less, we want to get more of it to the nucleus and we think we can uh, target uh, that process. And so that's just shown here. So that's one of the major strategies that we have um, for targeting the osteogenic defects. We also would like to um, extend this um, time of cell division. So if it's simply a matter of the cell needs more time to organize itself to separate the chromosomes, um, maybe then that will um, alleviate that defect. So these are things that are pretty easy to test in a dish um, where we can also use um, drugs that are already FDA approved and therefore more amenable uh, to treatment options. Um, and just finally, in terms of neurogenesis, so again, we can take these stem cells and using um, different factors that we might add to this media, um, depending on what we want to do, we're, we're probably going to study these cortical projection neurons. We can um, target their differentiation through particular um, additions to the media. And then when we have these cells, we can um, try to understand the processes going on. And again, as I said, up to now, most people have studied a complete knockout, which again is what's modeled here. So this is a neuron with a complete knockdown of SAPI2. Um, and you'll notice that there are um, these increased connections between this one neuron. So it's connecting to itself um, more so than this, which is a wild type, which is extending out um, more uh, to, to make connections with other neurons. So <clears throat> we'd like to know how the different uh, mutations might be affecting this, and, and particularly what is um, the gene regulatory network or the protein interaction that might be uh, regulating this. So another advantage of this system is that we can see what um, metabolic outputs there may be by um, evaluating um, these cells either through uh, protein or gene expression analysis, which I've already showed you, to help us understand how we might be able to target um, therapies to this process. Um, so those are our goals. Um, and we have, so unfortunately I have to leave almost when I finish uh, today, but uh, we'll have hopefully a few minutes for questions as well as you can email me uh, at any time. The reason why I'm rushing home is because we're getting these uh, skin samples in the lab tomorrow um, and I need to get them on the dish um, so that we can start this, this research project. So I would just end by acknowledging the rest of uh, the people in my lab um, as well as um, our funding and collaborators. So um, if there's any questions, I will uh, be happy to try to answer them. Yes. So the ones that I'm specifically referring to are I'm mostly aware of because of, through the bone cells because that's what we, we have a, now a pretty good idea of what the defect is. Um, we need to study the neurons 
um, in culture to see what exactly is the process that's disrupted. And absolutely, it's 100% our intent to, to try to study or you know, have a drug therapy for that as well, but we just uh, have not studied, we just haven't studied it yet, so we don't know the processes that could be targeted. But um, last year when I was here and I, I had a chance to talk to um, a number of people and we're very keen on, of course, um, treating as well some of the, the neurological defects, which are definitely harder. There's no question about that, but, but we are going to be looking at that. And this, this IPSC system allows us to do that in a way that we, that we really can't do in the mouse system. Okay. So. If you guys have questions, we can come up, if you don't mind, so that way we can get it on the video, too. to ask you, um, um, if you're thinking about uh, treating the neuronal cells, um, what could it do for a person with SES? Because uh, I guess some of the functional uh, structural defects have already taken place uh, and won't change. And what do you think could possibly change if you were to, to sort of treat, you would find a drug to uh, to affect the neurons? Right, so that's a good question. And again, I would say it depends on exactly what um, defect we may find. We do know that, that certain neurons are capable of changing their axonal uh, projections. So there's a lot of research on um, just in general regeneration um, of brain cells, just you know, with the Alzheimer's um, and other um, types of neurological defects. There has been um, a significant amount of research in, let's say, regeneration um, of neurons. And, and certainly the ability, even though the, the cell is post-mitotic, that doesn't mean that it's not a living cell and that it's not capable of changing in some way. Now, um, again, I think it's really hard to answer that question in the absence of knowing specifically um, what the defects are. Um, but I, I, I think that we, we certainly, um, we don't want to be overly optimistic, but the, the neurons, as I said, they are still living cells and that there is some potential um, that, that their cell structure can be modified in the, in the same way that, that other cells are able to um, change some of their features. So, but I certainly can't say anything, you know, specific, right? Um, certainly we don't expect that from one day to the next a language um, uh, deficiency would be be altered um, but we wouldn't be doing the research if we didn't think there was some potential might be selfish and ask a couple first ones be pretty easy what medical journals can be published in so for this um, work on the mouse cells, we're trying to um, publish it in a journal called Bone. Um, so I think that all of these uh, SAPI2 specific uh, publications are on the, um, either on the Facebook page or on the SAPI2 um, uh, gene pager. So yes, so we'll, we'll know about that. Um, yes, yeah, so you, you should be able to have access to them. And second, I thought I came last year, last year, I thought yep. that this gene wasn't really the best candidate for CRISPR because of the, uh, the mutation happening so early in development. And um, so are there other ways of trying to fix this, such as targeting the heterozygote or the allele that's not affected, maybe trying to get it to work harder? Right, so, so um, that's the major, uh, let's say a major component of what um, we would like to convey is that um, Modifying the gene in humans, you know, to use CRISPR to modify the gene in humans is not um, a, a very likely approach. Um, neither is, so there was some discussion about, oh, can we just, um, you know, take a sappy 2 pill like a vitamin? Um, probably will not be effective in, in that case because sappy 2 needs to find the cell that it's working in appropriately and it also needs to get into the nucleus which is not something that you can take just as a pill. So um, what we need to do is find ways to um, modify what the cell is doing. So um, 
that's where we are saying we're not going to target the gene specifically, or we're not going to target the DNA. We're going to try to understand what that protein is doing in the cell, what is the process, and target the process. Um, and also, so that has two uh, benefits. One is that there are um, many, many genes in, in your genome and relatively fewer processes. So it's much easier to, to develop drugs uh, for particular processes. So it makes a, a potentially rare disease um, more common if you think about all the different diseases and how they affect particular processes. So the, the goal would be one, let's say, obvious treatment that I was discussing is that let's say that you only have 50% of your SAPI2 protein in a cell, if some of it is not in the appropriate place because it's being modified, what we want to do is alter that modification in such a way that now we get all of the available protein um, in, the cell, in the appropriate location to manage its process. So that's um, the first uh, component. And that is something that um, is realistic um, to target at this stage um, of our, our research, as opposed to trying to target specific mechanisms that would increase, just generally increase, let's say, the production of the good protein from the um, wild type allele. So that's something that, that um, is, is not something that's easy to do. Um, in fact, I don't know that anyone has tried to do that. On any gene. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you very much for your research and your sure. Um, I'm curious to know uh, as far as the, the in, there's lots of kids that have the various different types of mutations, right? So what's the evidence that the, the, that the mutated gene is not being expressed as a dominant negative uh, as opposed to being degraded or causing the cells to go through apoptosis? Right, so um, one, I would say that for each, we don't have the evidence for all of the mutations, sure. but um, so in the one case I showed you the Western blot, so where they were able to use an antibody to detect the SAP2 protein, and then they showed that um, it, it was at a, let's say, a different location to wild type. So in the Western blot, what happens is you put the protein in this gel and it migrates according to size. So if you have two bands, um, they're going to be of different size, and what they found was that in the, in the human, in the patient cells, they had the second band at a, a smaller size, and that was indicating it was truncated. Now, um, so that means it's producing a protein. Now, is that having a dominant negative effect, or is it just not having any effect at all? Um, we don't always know. So that's absolutely something we're looking at. Um, what I didn't tell you is that in our um, uh, osteogenic cells, we have two different um, heterozygote mutations, and one of them has uh, a quite severe uh, proliferation defect. In fact, it seems to be even uh, slower than the complete absence of SAP2. So that, and it's always possible that something else is wrong, so we haven't eliminated that, but it also suggests that maybe that mutation is doing something in a dominant negative fa fashion that is um, increasing on the defect. So we will, we are investigating that. And that's another thing. So of the um, volunteers that we have to participate in this, um, the pluripotent stem cells, we have different types of, of mutations. So we have some point mutations, we have some deletions, um, and we'll be able to specifically then address those different types of mutations. It's really hard to use, uh, to generate a point mutation with the CRISPR. It's easier to generate a deletion. So we, it's hard to model those, but with iPSCs, you know, it will be straightforward. Um, and then because if we have two individuals with point mutations from different families, we can also compare on the difference in their, their background. Um, so that's something that we're very interested in, is, is there a dominant negative effect or is it just the dosage effect? Have you considered maybe expressing some of the genes that are, are missense mutations? Uh, but not truncations, just recombinantly to see if you get a phenotype. So you mean in a, like a specifically in a, or just in a wild type? Yeah. Um, so we, we could do that. Um, we, we haven't done that. Um, so we, would, we could do that. You could generate that mutation in a plasmid and then let's say overexpress it. Um, we haven't taken that approach. We've been, uh, so one reason why we might not do that is because you get a defect just with the overexpression, 
that sometimes doesn't model, since we know dosage is important. Um, we will be able to still address that with our, with our system, with IPSCs, um, to, to model these different mutations. In your uh, osteoblast culture model, are those immortalized cells, or are they yes. primary cells? Yes, they're immortalized. We have also um, looked at um, these primary cells, so we're doing that now, um, which would be, in my mind, a very solid um, support for the fact that this is a, um, a defect of the SAPI2, not something we've done with CRISPR. Um, so that is going to be another month because we haven't got those cells. But we've done with the wild type, so we know that it, we can get the primary cells, we can put them in our assay, we know that it works. Um, we just have the timing of our mouse colony. We won't have the, the heterozygotes until the end of this month. But yes, we're, we're doing it in primary cells as well. Right. Yeah, so if anyone has questions later, um, so I believe that this PowerPoint will be um, available um, online so you can um, review the slides, um, try not to post them too much out into the internet. <laughs> but uh, my, my email address is there on the first slide and you're welcome to, to ask me um, questions or email me any time and I'm happy to um, do my best to answer them. So, thank you.